Well, good morning. Good morning. Would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We live in a broken world. A broken world. Broken promises, broken relationships, broken homes, broken lives. And we're all aware of this fact. Even Pastor Paul yesterday at the joyous celebration of David and Lauren's wedding reminded us that this could be the generation that witnesses the death of marriage. Not only because people are refusing to get married, but because the divorce rates are growing and growing, it seems. And if they're declining, it's only because people are too afraid to even make those commitments. And there are so many broken relationships along the way. We're all aware of this fact on a global level because every day in the news we hear about wars and unrest in the world. There's a constant cry for peace in the Middle East, and yet there is no peace we hear the appalling uh, statistics of broken relationships like divorce around the country and around the world. In fact, I recently saw a post that the Norwegian government is intervening to prevent divorce. They have a 40% divorce rate. And so the new Minister for Children, Equality, and Social Inclusion says that the government needs to cut divorce rates, and so uh, they're, they're on a campaign to institute date nights. They say they're falling short of mandating this, and yet they're encouraging it through campaigns that date nights will solve their problem of divorce. It's probably safe to say that not one of us in this room has not been impacted by divorce, whether it be personally or through a family member or a friend. And certainly not one of us in this room has not suffered some sort of a personal breach in relationship with someone else in some form or another, whether it was for a short time or a long time. Some in this room are still suffering from the pain of severed relationships that seem to never be possibly mended, no matter how hard you try. And the reasons for these broken relationships may be quite varied. They may even be the result of the refusal of believers to compromise the truth. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 34 and 35, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And he was speaking in this regard to the truth that the gospel divides, and sometimes that happens, and sometimes those breaches are the most painful because we wish so badly that the rift between us and our unsaved family members would be healed, and yet we dare not compromise the truth. We've all either been involved in or heard about church splits or have had the weight of being involved in the final step of church discipline brokenness all over. But let's be clear that any brokenness in our world, any severed relationship between human beings in whatever form, whether it's on a national level or an interpersonal level, whatever level, is ultimately a result of that first great breach between the relationship of God and man. We all understand Genesis 3 recounts the sad offense of man against the Creator with whom he had perfect fellowship in the garden, and the subsequent rift that resulted as the curse of sin entered the world. Romans 5.12 sums up the devastating effect of the fall. Through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Separation. Because of this first man's sin, the curse of sin is passed to everyone, And every man is separated from God from the moment of conception. We're born physically alive, and yet we're spiritually dead, cut off from the life of God. And Scripture speaks of the natural man not as having peace with God, not as being on a neutral plane with God, but being his very enemy. We are at enmity with God. And mankind's desire for peace and harmony and unity and human relationships that we see so prevalent throughout our world today pales in comparison to our deepest need for reconciliation with God. 
And the passage before us this morning informs us that we who have come to know God, who have been reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, have not only been reconciled to Him, but that He has chosen us as the very channels through which the message of reconciliation comes to our broken world. Let's read it together, verses 14 to 21. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And He died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation." Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What a beautiful passage of Scripture, one of my favorite. Reconciliation in its most basic form is the restoring of two parties to a proper relationship. But the theological meaning of this is, is much more deep and much more rich, as we'll see. In human relationships, as the saying goes, it takes two to tango, and there's usually uh, offense on both sides, sometimes an initial offense and then usually a responsive offense. Typically, the party who was initially offended waits for the other one to come to them to reconcile. And although believers know better all too seldomly within the church and especially in the world does the party who was offended seek to mend the relationship, especially when it costs something. But in the case of God and man, the offense was entirely one-sided. God did nothing to offend us. He is perfectly righteous and holy. The offense was all ours, and yet the offended one set out to reconcile sinners to himself. And it cost him everything, the death of his precious son. I love what Romans 5, verses 6 through 8 says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this morning, if I were to ask the question, why should we evangelize? Why should we share the gospel with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family? There would likely be a variety of answers given. Some might say, well, because God commands us to, and that is definitely true. Others might say, because people need to be saved, and that's certainly true as well. But I think there's a more foundational motivation for our evangelism. And it's the very fact that we ourselves have been reconciled to God. We see this in the Apostle Paul's description of himself. And in this description, I think he describes the heart of every believer who has their minds fixed upon what God has done for them in Christ. Verses 14 through 21 are, are amidst an argument which sort of colors this whole letter. And this argument was fully launched back in chapter 3. And the whole theme of Paul's argument is this reluctant defense of his apostleship and his divine message in the face of attacks from false teachers in Corinth, and even those within the Corinthian congregation who had been swayed by these false teachers. And so Paul has reluctantly been giving this defense of his apostleship. He's been making the point that he himself is inadequate if it's all about him, it's, if it's all coming from him, he is completely inadequate in and of himself for this new covenant ministry which he's been given. And yet God has equipped him for it. He's adequate through God. And Paul believed this to the core of his being, so much so that he says in these chapters that he was content to suffer for the sake of Christ. And he's assured of the reward that awaits him 
as he remains faithful to Christ. And we pick up the immediate context of this in verse 11, where he's using this first-person plural pronoun, we, to describe himself. And he states that knowing the fear of the Lord or the reverence of the Lord, that he desires to persuade men of the truth of the gospel. And he's confident here, he says in verse 11, that, that he's made manifest to God, that God knows what his pure motives are. And his concern is that the Corinthian believers would know that his motives are pure as well. He's not only persuading them of the gospel to fully embrace it and not be carried away by these false teachers, but to have an occasion to come to Paul's defense. He's not commending himself, but providing an answer for those who would accuse him of wrongdoing. These false teachers are those who, unlike Paul, take pride in appearance and not in heart. And they had leveled various accusations against him. Look at verse 13. He says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. And these false teachers had, had apparently accused Paul of being so radical about his faith that he was some religious fanatic, literally outside of his mind, the word means. And he gladly accepted that accusation for it was to God. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 10, he called himself a fool for Christ. He said, we are fools for Christ. He says, if we are of a sound mind, that's even better, for his goal was to communicate clearly to the Corinthians this, this gospel, this message of reconciliation. And ultimately, what Paul is trying to drive home in his argument, in this defense that he reluctantly brings up, is that his ministry is not about him. He says, it's not about me. It's about God, and it's about you, to reconcile you to this God that I love. In verse 14, Paul states the primary motivation for his ministry, and that is that the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. That word control means hold together or constrain, and in some translations render it compel. This was the controlling factor of Paul's life. It was the thing that motivated him, that drove him. Before he had been driven by his prideful zealousness, and now he's driven by this love for Christ. But it wasn't necessarily his love for Christ. It was, first of all, Christ's love for him. Because he says there that he had come to this solid conclusion. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. God had opened Paul's eyes to this wonderful, wonderful truth of the gospel. That the one who is the Lord Jesus had died for all, and that Paul, through placing his faith in Christ, had become one of those all. And Paul's not saying here by all that, that um, everyone is going to be in Christ because we know that not everyone is saved. That's the whole point of giving this message out. But those who are truly among those that God has chosen who respond to the gospel message, those are the ones who die to themselves. And dying to yourself is that wonderful truth of being united in Christ, united to Jesus in his death and his burial and his resurrection and having all of the benefits of that, like we read in Romans 6. It's what Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Me, me, me. Jesus did it all for me, Paul says, and my life is to be lived for him, no longer for myself. And this was the very purpose that Christ died, to reconcile sinners to himself so that we wouldn't live for ourselves any longer, but for him who died on our behalf. And Paul, still speaking of himself, begins to include all believers in this statement and so the we here and the us here sort of become all of us, because this is true of all believers. And this conclusion was the one thing that controlled and compelled the Apostle Paul, and will control and compel us if we will fix our minds upon it. 
It was the ultimate motivation for his ministry to others. God's love for Paul demonstrated in Christ's sacrifice on his behalf gave fuel to his fire, to his passion for a life that wasn't about himself any longer, but was for pleasing God. It was a change in purpose, and that's the first point in your outline a change in purpose. This motivation was a complete change in purpose from a life of pleasing self to a life of pleasing God, a radical redirection of Paul's life. And implicit here and explicit in all of Scripture is the fact that man by his very nature is self-centered. The fall has caused us to want to be our own gods, and we go around seeking our own pleasures, our own delights. Ephesians 2.3 says that the believer prior to salvation, formerly lives in the lusts of his flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, just like everyone else in the world, until the light comes on, until God shines the light of the gospel in our hearts. Because those who believe this fundamental shift has taken place in our hearts so that now what compels our actions is not our own personal pleasure, not our own personal uh, seeking desires, but a desire wholly, completely to serve God, His things. And that passion to no longer live for yourselves but for Him who died and rose again was born out of His action for us. This is nothing that comes from the heart of the natural man. It comes all in response to what Christ has done for us. We love because He first loved us. God took the initiative and demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I believe that meditating upon that truth will change the purpose and direction of our lives. And if you've grown cold over your walk as a believer and that's not the direction of your life, I pray that this morning you will be rekindled to be motivated to live your life not for your own pleasure, not for yourself, but for Him who died and rose again. And that means that we do that toward His body, toward one another. We live our lives in a sacrificial service. We with Paul can live our lives no longer for ourselves. To live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what Paul said, and that can be true of us. Paul said just in chapter 5 that whether we're at home with the Lord or we're here on earth, wherever we may be, our aim, our ambition is to please Him in everything that we do. And so Christ's love for us demonstrated in the cross motivates us to this new purpose, but it also gives us a change in perspective. Look at verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. A complete change in perspective. Our eyes have been opened so that now we see things no longer in a temporal sense, but in an eternal sense. Before we saw all men according to the flesh, or I like how the NIV renders it, from a worldly point of view. We saw everyone from just a fleshly, worldly point of view. And worst of all, we saw Christ in the same way. Christ to us was just another man. Perhaps we admired him as a good teacher, or maybe for some of us, like myself as a child, he was the distant figure in the Sunday school stories, sort of like a mythical character. Perhaps we were indifferent to him, or maybe even hostile toward him as Paul was. Paul had persecuted Christ until that day on the road to Damascus, where Christ confronted him and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And now we see Christ as he truly is, the glorious Lord, the glorious Savior of the world, our new master, the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And now we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Now we walk by faith and not by sight, he says in chapter 5, verse 7. So not only do we see Christ differently, but now we see everyone differently. 
We see people differently. Everything changes when a believer's eyes are open. Once others were merely viewed from the outside, we judge them by our own biases, our own prejudices, and we lived in this kind of dog-eat-dog world, comparing ourselves among other people, judging people by their outward appearance, by their, their measure of success, their popularity. And we were like all men looking on the outward appearance. But now with God, we see the heart. We can't see the heart of men. We don't know every detail of men's hearts, but we now see them not as merely fleshly creatures, but we see them as souls that need to be saved. We see others in this light, and it allows us to understand their need. We have compassion, and we begin to be burdened for them. We begin to share God's desire, which is that all men will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. We desire that people will be saved, no longer judging them, no longer viewing them as just another human being in our way that we should step over or move aside, but we see them as precious, precious souls that need a Savior, just like we did. Remembering that once we were just like them, but we've been washed, we've been justified, we've been sanctified by our God. Well, not only does this realization of Christ's work on our behalf change our purpose and give us a new perspective, but it gives us an entire change in person. Verse 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. I love that verse. It's one of the verses I memorized early on when I first came to Christ, knowing that I was a new creature in Christ. And it's that glorious, glorious truth that we're in Christ, that union with Christ, sharing in all of the benefits of His death, burial, and resurrection. It's a total change in person from the old man to the new man. The old me is dead. It's that thing that's pictured so beautifully in baptism as the old man goes into the water and is dead and is raised to life. Not that that baptism has anything to do with the reality of that. It's a picture of the reality that's within our hearts, what God has done for us, spiritually putting to death that old man with Christ and making us new. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I used to like to watch that, that show, uh, Extreme Makeover, where there would be a crew of people who would come in, and within like 24 hours, they would completely just renovate a house. They'd take kind of a, a shack-looking house and turn it into this beautiful place. You guys have seen that. That's awesome, but guess what? That's not what God does to us. God is more like bringing a bulldozer in and knocking that house over and rebuilding it from scratch. We are brand new. We've been created as new creatures in Christ. And the wonderful thing here is that the tense of these verbs are important. The old things passed away signifies that there was a point in time where those things passed away and they're dead. Our old man is dead. And yet it says new things have come. And really what it means is that they just keep coming. New things just keep coming. And all of these things are from God. They're all from God. They're the new attitudes of the heart and the new actions that are born out of them as God begins to work through us, as His Spirit begins to change us, as we really become to look like that new creature that we really are, more and more and more in our experience, as God works that out. All of these benefits are a result of the fact that God has reconciled us to Himself, and one of the most wonderful things that he's given us, one of the new things that we have in store for us is the fact that he's passed on to us this ministry of reconciliation. We become partakers of these benefits of reconciliation, a new purpose, a new perspective, a new identity in Christ. And now God calls us to enlist us in this service for him of spreading the good news, this offer to this broken world of reconciliation. That word ministry is really the word servant, the service of reconciliation. We are servants. We are slaves of Christ. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 5, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, 
and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. And we must not forget how great a privilege it is, not only to be saved, not only to have all of the benefits of being reconciled to God, but the fact that God would actually count us worthy to be His very channels of grace to the world. And it's not on the basis of anything we have done, all upon the basis of what Christ has done. Paul took this very seriously. He said in chapter 4, verse 1, we have this ministry as we received mercy. We have this ministry as we received mercy. Because we've been reconciled, God has given us this merciful and gracious gift of being the very channels of grace to the world. John MacArthur writes, there is no higher calling, no greater privilege, no more urgent task than the ministry of reconciliation that God has entrusted to all believers, every one of us. Paul is speaking about himself here as as the ambassador of Christ, as an apostle of Christ, and yet each one of us who have been saved are given this ministry. And God has called us to pass this along. And what is this ministry? Well, first of all, it's a message. It's a message of reconciliation. He says in, in verses 18 and 19, that he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And so there's a few things we learn about what this message is. This message, first of all, is the fact that it was initiated by God, as we already saw, that sinners have nothing to give to this, that they're spiritually dead, They have no spiritual muscle to move themselves toward God. It is all the working of God. He initiates it. And man is dead in his trespasses and sins. It's Christ who makes him alive. And how does he do this? Well, he does it through Christ. He says in this verse, verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself. And that's really a dative of agency or means. It's talking about the way that God did this. God, through Christ, was reconciling the world to himself. And by world here, he means that this offer goes not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. It's for everyone. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16 says, Therefore, remember that formerly the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile both of them in one body to the cross, having put it to death the enmity. So this call of reconciliation goes out to all men freely, and yet we know that all men will not be saved. Not all men will be saved. Jesus' death was of infinite value. It was, of course, powerful enough to save everyone if that's what God had intended, and yet we know that it's only efficacious for those who respond in truth, those who repent of their sin and trust in Jesus, who reach out to God's outstretched hand of reconciliation, offering this free gift and take that gift, turning from their own way and turning to Jesus. Well, in verse 21, Paul further elaborates on this wonderful means. He's already stated that reconciliation comes as a matter of forgiveness. In verse 19, he says, not counting their trespasses against them. And in verse 21, he elaborates on how, in fact, he did that. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.21, this one little verse could really be a whole message in itself. It's probably the most concise and most salient verse in all of Scripture that speaks about the atonement of Christ. We see here that God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, or to be sin for us. And what does He mean by that? He means that Jesus, the the perfect sinless one, the God-man, the one who never sinned, who lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross, actually took our place and stood in for us as our substitute upon that cross. And instead of our sins being counted to us, God can count them toward Jesus, and He did at the cross. In verse 19, that word counting their sins, counting their trespasses against them, is, is a, an accounting term. It's the word logizomai. And it's the same word that Paul uses in Romans 4 to talk about the fact that we've been declared righteous in God's sight. We've been reckoned as righteous. It's where we get the word impute. It's a, it's a crediting term. It's an accounting term. And so God is saying that Jesus, although He was sinless, God credited to Him all of our sin. He put it all upon Jesus, and Jesus bore it all on the cross. Jesus, the servant of Yahweh in Isaiah 53, fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah 53. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed." All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus took all of our sin and guilt and shame and died upon the cross bearing the weight of that, the sinless one for sinners. And I often think about the physical pain of Christ on the cross probably paled in comparison to the spiritual pain as he took the weight of that sin upon himself. And God's wrath was completely poured out upon him as he stood in my place. But God's lavishing grace doesn't stop there. Look at the second part of this verse. This verse tells us that that God canceled out our sin debt. He can completely forgive our sins because Christ has paid our debt in full It's gone. It's now as far as the east is from the west, paid in full, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And how does He do this? Well, we have no righteousness of our own. God not only credits our sin to Christ, but then He turns around and He credits, He imputes, He logizomize all of of Christ's righteousness to our account. And this righteousness, as Paul states in Philippians 3, 9, it's not a righteousness of our own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. When we believe in Jesus, God credits all of His righteousness to our account so that we can be declared justified, righteous before God. It's through the work of Christ through His death, through His burial, through His resurrection, that we're now forgiven and declared righteous, removing that that barrier between us and God and allowing us to be reconciled to Him, to be made right. And no longer are we called God's enemies, but Jesus says we can be called His friends. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. Well, that glorious message of which we're all partakers in that glorious Savior who, who bore our sins and whose righteousness was credited to our account is the wonderful message, message that we have to share with others, the means through which He accomplished that. And that last point in verses 19 and 20, He speaks of the messengers of reconciliation. We see that the message of reconciliation has been committed to us. Look at that in verse 19. And he has committed to us the word or the message of reconciliation. 
He's given us this treasure, this treasure, and yet we're not supposed to keep this treasure to ourselves. He's actually enlisted us, verse 20 says, as ambassadors for Christ. We are the very heralds of Christ, those who serve King Jesus, just as Paul did. Paul, as he passed on the baton to Timothy, said, teach other men who will be able to teach others also. And as we fall in that line, that baton passes to us, all of us who have been redeemed, who have been reconciled, that we would now go to this broken world and share that message. Because God's glory and the eternal destinies of men are at stake. And it's not that we just pass on this sort of dry package deal. Some have turned the gospel into just this kind of, you know, a few points, pray this prayer and believe and we're all done you know, put another notch on the belt, got another one saved. That's not what Paul is talking about here. This was something that Paul had embraced, that it impacted his life. And as he shared this message, he was sharing the very life-giving truth of Jesus. And he says in verse 20, as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. When we share the gospel with others, we're telling them, hey, I've heard good news. Jesus has reconciled me to himself. All my sins have been forgiven, and I've been been made right with God, and heaven awaits, and all things are new. I'm a new creature in Christ, and guess what? He's inviting you too. I'm the ambassador of Christ to bring this good news to you. Would you embrace him? I beg you. Why would you keep going this way? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. It's the ministry of reconciliation. And if you're here today among us and you don't know Christ, I beg you with these very words, be reconciled to God through Christ. You can do that here and now at this very moment. God is not waiting for you to do anything other than Turn away from your own way and put your trust fully in Jesus, the one who paid for our sin. Paul goes on in chapter 6, in verse 2, quoting from Isaiah. He says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Be reconciled to God. And for those of us like myself who have been reconciled to God, when it comes to sharing this message, I know in my own life I can grow cold about that. I can grow stilted. And I pray this morning that we would be struck once again by the amazing links that God took to initiate our salvation to reconcile us to himself. I pray that the love of Christ would control us, would compel us, that we would leave here and no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf, not caring about our own comfort and pleasure, but caring about serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we could do that, and that when we, when we share the gospel, it's not out of duty because God commanded us, It's not out of guilt because I I haven't really reached out to people in a while and I really should do this, but that it's just part of who we are because we're overflowing with the love of Christ, that the love of Christ would control us and compel us to fulfill this ministry of reconciliation, to bring others to God in this broken world. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the wonderful message of reconciliation that you through Christ have offered us free pardon, a righteous standing before you, that it's a free gift, that you initiated it, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from you, lost in this world in darkness, with our eyes blinded to the truth, and yet you opened our eyes to that truth those of us who know you. And long ago, you paid for our sin in full when our Lord Jesus died in our place. 
as our substitute and rose again on our behalf. I pray, Father, that we would be rekindled to have a passion for you, to serve you, and to spread this wonderful message of reconciliation for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.